All right, so I'm Kim Holder. I teach at the University of West Georgia. I'm a lecturer of economics in the Richards College of Business, and I'm also the director of our Center for Economic Education. So how many of you know what a Center for Economic Education does? A couple, a few, so clearly we have some work to do in our marketing. Um, Centers for Economic Education, we work with national and state councils, and we teach K through 12 teachers how to teach economics. So that means I have two jobs. I teach regular undergraduates, pr principles of micro, macro, intro to business, uh, what do you know about economics, personal finance, those sorts of classes. And then I also teach K-12 teachers how to teach econ, because a lot of K-12 teachers, um, they focused on like social studies or history, and some of them have never even had an econ class ever in their life. And so I try to help them become more comfortable with the content. And to me, what's kind of cool about connecting across all grade levels is you get a really different perspective. And so you realize that the things that happen in K-12 affect the type of students that come into our classrooms. You also realize that there's not that big of a difference between the person who graduates from high school and shows up in your class in the fall. They have not magically grown up. Um, I also have a little bit different perspective because I have teenage boys and I get to kind of run little experiments on them myself at home and I realize also that they're not growing up, right? They're not really getting some of the things that um, I want them to get. Now, I believe if we kind of work together, if people reach across and we work through this K through 16 space, that we can have really, really profound changes in economics education, but it's going to take a lot of work. And it takes a lot of this connectivity where people um, talk about ideas, they talk about things like soft skills, which is really important, um, even in the high school space, they're doing a lot of work in that. And it allows us to kind of grow together. And this is something that is not done quite enough. Um, what I do is, since I sit at this weird intersection between these two spaces, is I do a lot of research on how to make economics more interesting, how to kind of grab people and make them pay attention. And I'm able to test that out in my own classroom. So everything that I show you is things that I've done with my own students. I'm able to do uh, research on it and then take it out to other teachers across the country. And so it's kind of a very fulfilling thing. It's very busy, um, but I kind of thrive on it. So today I want to talk with you a little bit about stories and the power of storytelling and how we can use that in our classroom. And my goal is to kind of lower the cost for you so that you're more likely to implement it into your classroom on Monday. Monday, right? Down. Okay. So the other day uh, I came across this great little quote and it said that experience has long been considered the best teacher of knowledge. Since we can't experience everything, then other people's experience become our surrogate for knowledge. I thought it was really interesting because we all have different levels of experience. And this means that stories can be our little pathway into learning, particularly for students or even some professors who have a relatively limited set of experiences. Stories are a way that we can make things come alive for them. It can move us past the boundaries of our classroom. It can challenge us into new ways of thinking. And it can also make topics that are difficult to talk about into a classroom, it can make them easier to address. So instead of talking about my my personal finance problems, I can talk about the person in the story. So it just makes it easier to deal with. And stories, when we deliver them, we can deliver them as a picture, it could be a movie clip, it could be um, a television show, it could be a video game or whatever. Well, stories, they're able to kind of hook us on learning. So when we go out there and we grab that student's attention, we have to make something that's appealing to them. Now, I don't know about you, for me, economics is naturally appealing. I love it, but my students don't always feel the same way. And so if I have this thing that attracts them, this little learning hook, then I can bring them into the classroom, and then I can eventually teach them the things that I want to teach them. Now, my ultimate goal is, of course, that I want them to fall in love with economics. That's my mission in life. It's my passion. I want them to be as crazy about econ as I am. Uh, I actually started teaching economics because my boyfriend at the time, he was an economics major. True story. And, you know, it was one of those things of just, I love it. I think about it all the time and I think about it every day. So I'm going to get started with my own story. So this is my story. This is part of why I'm passionate about teaching economics. It's part of why I'm passionate about breaking down barriers for students. And it's because this is how I started out. So I was born in South Korea. 
And I know that you're probably kind of thinking to yourselves, but she sounds like she's from Alabama, but I'm not. All right. So I was born in South Korea. Um, and for the first uh, two years of my life, almost, um, I kind of ran around into different foster homes and orphanages. And so my initial introduction into this world of econ was this idea of a market. There is a baby market. I was kind of a, um, a, I was exchanged and traded. Um, I was an import and an export across countries. Um, and so if you think about this, it kind of opens up the way that you're thinking. I'm not trying to be dismissive of it. Um, you know, it was a, a difficult experience and also a very rewarding experience. I feel like I hit, you know, the, the life lottery. I ended up in, in the United States. It was fantastic. But it is kind of where I started. And so for me, I tell my students this story so that they understand where I'm coming from, so that they realize that at my university, um, we have a really high number of students who are first-time uh, college graduates. So they don't have a great support system at home, and I can tell them my first goal is to just bring you in, to try to take care of you, to try to help you, and to try to teach you uh, in the same way that I want my own children to be taught. And that's my base for everything that I do. And so I tell them that because when I think about these boundaries that come up in between um, our students and the content that we want them to learn, well, I think about something like this. And I don't know if you're familiar with this picture of the two Koreas, but it, we realize there's this divide, right? And there's this idea of the fact that institutions matter. We can talk to them about economic development, and it allows us to have a really personal connection with the story. It's really easy to think about something that's happening across the world that may or may not re readily affect our lives, but when I can tell them my story and connect them with it, they pay a little bit more attention. So how do I get something like this across to a student who has no idea, they really maybe haven't even been out of the state, they don't think about things on a macro level, they don't think about the fact that the rules of the game, the institutions, the policies that we put in place matter. Well, I like to play games with them. And so I kind of go old school, none of this technology gaming, we play Monopoly. All right, so we play a rigged game of Monopoly to try to help them learn a bit about economic development. Now, I'm not the first person who's tried this. Um, there's actually a macro professor who uses it um, where he does lending. He talks about the Federal Reserve Ratio. Um, and he talks about um, this idea of making loans and the money supply. There's another professor who uses it um, to teach about uh, this Australian um, super tax. And he uses it in his classroom using chance cards and puts in different policies and that sort of thing. So what I do with it is I play a rigged game where students choose an envelope. They choose like one through five, and they get an initial allocation, and the allocations are different. They're not the same. And they get a certain amount of money, a certain amount of property, and then every time they pass the word go, they get a certain level of income. These incomes are not the same. They're not equitable at all. And so we play a couple of rounds of the game, and then we can have a conversation, and we can say what happened. And what always comes up is, it's not fair. If I had known I should have chosen number three instead of number one, it's not fair. Or I can never catch up with the person who has this larger initial allocation. And how many rounds would I have to play to catch up? And that offers us an opportunity to talk about economic growth. We can talk about it on the individual level. We can talk about it country by country. We can talk about what it would take, what kind of rules we would have to institute to try to make things even, and do we really want things to be fair? Do we really want things to be envy-free? We can have all those conversations and they can talk about it in context of the game. So these stories about wealth and income, well, they're not new. They're present in lots of things that we do. And so those of you who have seen me before, you know that I like to play around with a lot of media. And so I have some work that's been done about trying to identify some of these movies that have some of these same themes in them about wealth and income and inequality and those sorts of things. And so we went out and we surveyed a bunch of economics educators and we said, hey, we want to find out what are the 10 best films for teaching economics. Again, we're trying to provide resources to the community to help lower their costs for them. And some of the things that I think are really interesting are It's a Wonderful Life, which is kind of a classic. 
Moneyball, which also talks about this difference in income, and the Hunger Games. All right, so these are just other ways, other stories. They're just better told stories than maybe you and I standing up in front of the classroom. So the other thing that I've done, and I know that you may know about this as well, is I've let students tell their own stories by setting uh, economic themes to music through Rockonomics, and it, it's part of a national contest, and it just allows us to kind of have fun, to take the things that they've learned, to put it into this story form, and allow them to go out and teach others with their music. I've also worked in the area of music, so not just um, making your own music, but going out and finding songs that help teach you economics. We actually found a song for every year from 1964 to 2014, and then we added 2015 recently to it, to try to find music, which again is just stories, but set to, um, set to a background. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is we see these exact same themes again, the same themes that we see in the Monopoly game, the same th themes that we see in our movies. We also see them in things like Taxman by the Beatles. We see it in Circulate by Young Jeezy. And we also see it in Cost of Living by Ronnie Dunn. And so these are just other ways to bring this into your classroom. So now I understand that sometimes you have to help students connect the dots. So they may not think of these things when they first hear the song. They just think it's a great song. But that's part of your job, right? Taking this something that is um, abstract out of your textbook and applying it to something that is concrete um, that they can reach back to on test day. So what I've been working on lately, um, which will help you if you're going to play bar trivia or anything like that later on, is dealing with this idea of sports. And I was so glad that James brought up ESPN because it makes an easy transition for me. Um, but I love sports, all things sports. Um, and, but my problem with how a lot of sports is used in economics is it's used kind of as a what not to do. So in the K through 12 space, particularly um, ESPN's 30 for 30, the broke film, is used a lot to teach about personal finance. And personal finance is just applied economics, right? It's just um, consumer econ. How should you allocate your resources on the personal level? And one of the things that happens is students, they're kind of naturally attracted to sports the industry, the athletes, they want to wear the things that the athletes wear. And when we tell them over and over to not do something, to not do what these athletes do with their money, they don't always listen, same as our students don't listen. So I set out to try to find some resources that we could find some positive people, some people who have done great things with their personal finance, and we could highlight those for the students so that they can learn from them and learn to pattern off of a good example instead of telling them what not to do. So I don't know if you know about um, Junior Bridgman. Anybody know who he is? You've been Googling? So Junior Bridgman attended the University of Louisville. He was drafted in 1975 by the LA Lakers, but he didn't stay there for long. He actually ended up playing for the Milwaukee Bucks for most of his career because he was traded for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who we all know. So we don't know who Junior Bridgman is, but we know what they traded him for. Now, he had 12 successful years in the NBA. He scored over 11,000 points. Again, you're welcome for trivia. Um, and after his retirement, he invested a lot of money in Wendy's franchises. He actually owns more than 160 Wendy's and 118 Chili's restaurants. So he's very successful. He sits on the board of the PGA. He's the president and owner of Bridgman Foods. And he also owns a stake in a company called Black Bear Beverages, which is a um, soft drink firm out of um, Milwaukee. So he has all of, these, all of this great wealth. But the interesting thing about Junior is that he got his start when he was still playing in the NBA. During the off season, he needed something to occupy himself. And so what he did is he bought his first franchise just to kind of stay out of trouble. This is a great concrete example of starting early, starting young, and also this idea of entrepreneurship, because we all think that we're going to be entrepreneurs, and so you can talk to your students about risk and what it takes, the qualities it takes to be a good entrepreneur. Now, does anybody know, since you knew about Junior, does anybody know about Ty Warren? He's a little more recent. 
in the 2000s. So Ty Warren was drafted into the NFL in 2003, played for the New England Patriots, and he promised his parents and his grandparents that he would someday finish school. And we know how these promises often go. Um, so as he got a little bit older and he had an injury and he had a couple of children and he realized that he needed to make good on this promise and that his future in the NFL was not secure. And so he decided to start going back to school. But there was one problem. When he went back to school, he had to do some like training and things like that during the off season. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think back to students who skip class, sometimes I talk with students about their opportunity cost for coming to class. And what's their next best alternative if they don't attend my class? And they tell me lots of stories, like I could be working instead, I could be doing these fantastic things instead, but we all know that for most students, their opportunity cost is sleeping instead, which is highly valuable to them, right, because uh, this idea is subjective, but it isn't the same kind of value that Ty Warren had. So Ty decided that he was going to accelerate his education and get things done so that he could graduate on time for his path. And what happened is he had to give up $250,000 in his off-season bonus so that he could finish his schooling. And there's tons and tons of articles about this because it was a fantastic story. And he said it was totally worth it. I want to see, I want my, you know, children to see that I'm making this investment in myself, that I'm fulfilling my promises. And this idea of investing in his own human capital is the kind of story that we can tell our students and the kind of thing that we can use to explain this idea of human capital and explain the difference between short-term gains and long-term gains. So just like with most things in economics, I feel like once you start to kind of see it, you can't stop seeing it, right? So you start to see econ in the world around you, and that's kind of what I want to pass on to my students. I want them to see econ no matter what they're thinking, in their music, in the movies, in the television they watch, in the sports that they watch and enjoy. So I kind of want to corrupt everything and make it all about econ. And so you may know that my students use a lot of social media. We do econ selfies. We do um, memes to teach. Um, and they get a, a lot of, um, I guess, utility out of this because they're applying the textbook materials into their everyday lives. And they're kind of creating their own stories. That's really what social media does. It allows you to tell your own story uh, without a filter. So the next step in this idea of using stories and images has been this idea of using comedy. And so I'm a big fan of comedy. I think it kind of loosens everybody up, particularly for my students who are first-time graduates. You know, they're a little tense in the classroom. And so you can give them this little piece of comedy to help them learn. So are you all reading ahead? That's fantastic. So what do you see? You see Kevin Hart, and he's saying, I'll have Coke. And they say, is Pepsi OK? And he wants to know if he can play with Monopoly money instead, which is an easy example to talk about substitutes. It's also a great time to talk about fiat money and what backs our currency, um, just in one simple image. On the other side, we have somebody who's talking about uh, Jim Gaffigan, who's talking about the benefits of salad and this idea um, that you can eat more and more of it and never be fully satisfied. But we know at some point you would reach that, that level of satisfaction. And so we can talk about marginal thinking and so on with the students. And so this is just an easy way to add another element into your course. It can be put on a test to kind of help loosen them up. It can be added into slides. Um, it can even be displayed on a slide, and you can do a little quiz and see if they can find the econ in it. Now, my favorite thing that I've been working on recently is Humans of New York. And Humans of New York, I don't know if you know the story, um, but it was started by Brandon Stanton, and it has this kind of cool backstory to it. So it's a photojournalism blog, and what happened is Brandon lost his job during the downturn in the economy. He worked in the financial sector, and so he decided he was going to go out and create this photo map of New York City. Just take a bunch of pictures, tag them to locations, so he could have this visual of the five boroughs. And as he went to go and take pictures, when you go up and take somebody's picture, you kind of have to talk with them a little bit. 
And so he would find that they each had a little unique story to tell. And so his pictures would have these maybe one or two sentence captions. The stories grew longer and longer. And now he's expanded this out where he has done a series on um, prisoners. He's done a series on the Syrian refugees. He's done a series on veterans and so on. And so it's not just limited to New York. Well, when we stumbled across this, we kind of thought this is a great way to use stories to teach economics. It's a way to take something that's very abstract and tie it back into this concrete story. And it allows us, again, to talk about subjects that are difficult. So if we want to talk about things like immigration, we can talk about it within the context of the Humans of New York blog. So I'm going to read this one to you and see if you can find the econ in it. So this guy says, I dropped out of college when I was 19, and now I'm going back at the age of 30. I didn't think I needed a degree for the longest time. I traveled a lot, and I've always been employed. But it's just gotten too embarrassing to keep explaining why I don't have a degree. It's a deal breaker with most women at this age. They might spend the night with me, but they won't call me in the morning. So I'm going back, but I'm much more focused now, and I'm impatient. I'm the oldest one in my class, so I don't even want to socialize. I have no interest in getting a beer with you after class unless you're good at trigonometry. So some of the things that we found in this, and we tried to tie these stories into a micro or macro classroom so that there is this natural progression uh, depending on which course you teach. Um, we found this idea of markets, the marriage market or the dating market, and you have to have this double coincidence of wants. So the person has to want what you have and you have to want what they have. Obviously, we know that a college degree is a signal in this market. It's a signal of your future income and this idea of cost versus benefits, as well as, again, the investment in human, human capital and the cost of search activity. And so that's a lot of econ in a single short paragraph. Let's try another one. This is one of my favorites. So I want to open either a liquor store or a funeral parlor. Why those two things? Well, I figure those are two things that everyone needs. It's pretty true. It's pretty on the money. Um, so what do we see here? Well, we see this idea of um, the price elasticity of demand. We know these are things uh, that people are going to want, that they're going to purchase. Uh, we also have this idea of entrepreneurship as well as substitutes or complements. Now, I think if I was going to give him a little bit of advice that he should do both, that this idea of a funeral parlor with a drive-up bar would be great. And it would be a really uh, good way to maximize on this idea of complementary services. Now, this story works really well with students um, because I think it says the things that maybe they're thinking or that they come to terms with during the course of teaching them. I wish I'd partied a little less. People always say be true to yourself, but that's misleading because there are two selves. There's your short-term self and there's your long-term self. And if you're only true to your short-term self, your long-term self slowly decays. And so what do we see here? We see this idea of intertemporal decision-making. We also see present bias as well as discounting. And so there's tons of these. We've gathered them all together for you, and then we're constantly adding new ones to, you, to it because Brandon puts stuff out every day. Um, he has this fantastic following on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and so you can go and search through the Honey archives yourself. But we've done a lot of the work for you. Another thing that you can do with your students is you can have them begin to tell their own stories. And I think this is really important because our students have a lot to say but they don't always know how to say it. We see that on their own social media, that sometimes it's just, it's, it's just weird, the things that are out there. And so we can help show them and help show them how to tell their story and how to connect with all the pieces and connect the econ to it. For me, I believe that by making economics relevant and making it very, very personal, it allows students to be uh, more accepting of the information. It allows them to see how econ is in the world around them and how it affects their everyday life. And I think it's really important not only to help them tell their story, but to tell your own as well. And one of the things that I think about as I've heard everybody talking today is this idea that you're the best teacher for your students. Right? You know what they need, and you know what pieces of your story they need to hear. 
And so I think that one thing that happens a lot of times when we come to conferences is we get worried about, like, am I doing enough? Am I doing the right thing for my students? And I would just say that you are. And this is just another layer that you can add into your classroom if you're interested. If you're not, that's okay. It won't offend me at all. But it's another way to get the information across. I love the math. I love the models. I love the rigor. But this is just another way to communicate the same information to your students. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. If you have experiences in this area of using your own stories to teach with um, your students, I'd love to hear more about it. I think one of the cool things about using stories is our brains are hardwired to accept that information. We do it as kids, and at some point we kind of forget about it. And so it's a really powerful way to connect with your students and to connect them with the content. Thank you.